Hello. Um, good morning to those of you who are joining us from the Americas. And good afternoon and evening to those of you joining from all over the rest of the world. On behalf of the Uyghur Human Rights Project, I am delighted to welcome all of you to this roundtable, which UHRP is co-hosting with the World Uyghur Congress. My name is Dr. Elise Anderson, and I am Senior Program Officer for Research and Advocacy at UHRP, and I will be moderating today's discussion. Uh, before we jump into introductions, I just wanted to let everyone know that the World Uyghur Congress and UHRP together are co-hosting a companion roundtable to this one. That's going to take place on Sunday, July 5th at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time in the U.S. or 4 p.m. Berlin Time. And that particular panel is going to feature exclusively Uyghur advocates and activists who will be speaking about the events uh, leading up to and surrounding July 5th. And that will include Mr. Dukun Esa, the uh, leader of the World Uyghur Congress. All right, so first I wanna kick things off by introducing the speakers on today's round table. Um, first, we have Ursula Gauthier, who is a reporter. Hello. Thank you. Um, writer and documentary filmmaker, currently working as a senior reporter at Lopes, where she reports about China, the Middle East and Europe. Her reporting, uh, China-based reporting on Uyghur issues in 2015 drew the ire of the Chinese government who denied her a visa renewal and effectively shut her out of the country for a piece that she wrote on Uyghur issues. We're also joined today by Dr. Sophie Richardson, who is the China Director for Human Rights Watch. Uh, Dr. Richardson says that it has been her privilege to learn about the Uyghur community and help advocate for people's human rights since she joined Human Rights Watch in 2006. Welcome and thank you so much, Sophie. Uh, we are also joined today by Dr. Ryan Thum, who is a senior research fellow at the University of Nottingham in the UK. His research interests concern intersections between China and the Muslim world. Um, and his first book, the, the Sacred Roots of Uyghur History, is a fantastic exploration of the, the role of religion in uh, you know, Uyghur identity. It also won a number of prizes. Um, Ryan has a number of ongoing research projects and is also a, an excellent tweeter, if you're interested in following him on Twitter. Um, Unfortunately, Dr. Timothy Gross, uh, who was originally slated to appear on this panel, is going to be unable to join us today, um, though he has sent a few remarks that I'll try to share at appropriate points throughout the roundtable. In his place, um, we are being joined delightfully by Nuri Turkel, a DC-based attorney and the co-founder and current board chair of the Uyghur Human Rights Project. Uh, Nori is a tireless advocate for Uyghurs and was recently honored with an appointment by Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi to a position as commissioner on the United States Commission for International Religious Freedom. So thank you, Nori, for thank joining you. us today. Thank you. Uh, and finally, to round out the speaker list on our roundtable, we have Dr. Adrian Zenz, who is currently a fellow at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. Uh, Adrian is world known for his data-driven research into China's ongoing campaign of repression against Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and others in the Uyghur region. His newest research report, titled Sterilizations, IUDs, and Mandatory Birth Control, uses government documents to explore CCC, CCP suppression of Uyghur birth rates in particular, and that was published by Jamestown Foundation just earlier this week. Thank you for joining us today, Adrian. Thank you for having me. All right, a few um, introductory remarks <coughs> on behalf of World Uyghur Congress and Uyghur Human Rights Project. July 5th, 2009 was one of the most defining and tragic days in modern Uyghur history. On that day, university students took to the streets of Urumqi to demand justice for Uyghurs who had been murdered in Xiaoguan, Guangdong in a racially motivated attack the previous month. At some point, bystander interference and police intervention into that demonstration turned what had been a peaceful display of civil action into a bloody incident. 
Official Chinese state media reported that 197 people died in what it called, quote, riots, a term that many Uyghurs continue to find offensive because it suggests that they set out to be violent on that day. Eyewitness accounts, however, told another story, one of brutality as the police opened fire on demonstrators, beat civilians in the street, <clears throat> and disappeared Uyghurs by the thousands over the months that followed. Chinese state media also suggested that most of the 197 who died on that day were Han, giving an impression that very few Uyghur lives were lost in the chaos of July 5th. Again, eyewitness accounts, including those by Uyghurs who have left the region since 2009, uh, give us a lot of other data points to the contrary. Uh, moreover, the days that followed July 5th were marked by even more unrest as vigilante mobs, mostly ethnic Han, roamed the streets of Urumqi with makeshift weapons, looking to injure and in some cases to kill in retaliation. The authorities, reluctant to allow much information in and out of the region, immediately used the Great <coughs> Firewall to cut off internet access, leaving residents with only an intranet for some 10 months. Uh, the Chinese government also claimed that the July 5th demonstration was organized at least in part by our event co-host today, the World Uyghur Congress, and um, has since gone on to attack the WUC and its leadership for that alleged involvement since. At WUC and the UHRP, we believe that these events on and surrounding July 5th mark a watershed moment for Uyghur history. The state had been repressing and attempting to assimilate Uyghurs for decades already. But after July 5th, their methods rapidly and drastically changed, leading us, in our minds, directly to where we are in the ongoing campaign of repression today. Um, and so today, our distinguished panelists who've gathered here with us are going to reflect on how these events marked a turning point in Chinese government policy toward the Uyghurs and how they paved the way for the Chinese state to move from what we have called systematic assimilation to this campaign of genocide. So our uh, event today will take place as a roundtable discussion. Um, I'm going to kick things off by posing a few framing questions to our panelists and um, all of you who are out there participating in the audience, please feel free immediately to start sending your questions in, uh, in the chat feature or the, the question feature on GoToWebinar. So we will begin fielding your questions almost immediately. And we really want you, all of you, to take a very central role in shaping what it is that we talk about today. All right, I promise I'm going to stop talking very, very <laughs> shortly. <laughs> <laughs> so I will kick things off with my first question, um, and I'll to start things off. I'll I'll just call on people, um, and and we'll let the conversation go organically from there. But my first question is: How did you panelists understand these events as they unfolded on and around July fifth, two thousand nine? So I'm really curious to hear what seemed the most salient or important to you, all of you, as you were following this news back in 2009? And I think to start, I will call on Ryan. Okay. Um, well, when I, um, when I saw images of, the, of, of people coming out on the streets, my, my first reaction was um, uh, that this, this, this marked a, a really notable willingness of Uyghurs who had a lot of grievances to complain about to, to get out on the street. But as in the following days, it became clear um, that the violence that ensued would be perhaps a bigger part of uh, the story. And um, I was in the US when this happened and uh, booked a ticket to go there to see what was going on. And I think I showed up two or three weeks afterward. Um, and it's really my opinions about uh, uh, these events really crystallized in the month or so after that. So two and three weeks, July, later July and, and August. And what really struck me when I was there was 
a level of ethnic animosity that I had not noticed before. Um, you know, there's a lot of, obviously there's always been a lot of ethnic tension, but um, Uyghurs tended to direct um, their, uh, especially outside of Urumqi in the rural areas, direct their anger at the government as much as they did at Han Chinese people, who many Uyghurs didn't see very often in their daily lives um, back then. Um, so I was really shocked when I came to Rumchi and saw, for example, boycotts going on where Han Chinese people were boycotting Uyghur businesses, Uyghur people were boycotting um, uh, Chinese businesses. Um, and then um, in the other thing that happened was that the Chinese government basically took this ethnic anger. Um, if you looked at any newspaper front page at the time, you saw the words ethnic unity all over the thing. It was trying to force the idea that we're all friends down everyone's throat. And then they slapped that onto um, giant military convoys and paraded them around every city and small town in the entire region. Um, and so I really thought that what, what was happening was that they were advertising that in a city where Uyghurs are minority, Urumqi, which is not how most Uyghurs lived at that time, most lived in, as majorities in rural areas. They really took this ethnic conflict that had developed in the very particular and strange environment of Urumqi and then spread it around to the rest of the country. Um, and so I was worried at the time that, that we would get increased ethnic tension, not just in Urumqi, but outside. And unfortunately, that's been borne out as we've seen that Uyghur acts of violent resistance, which were quite rare before 2009, increased in number and in Uyghur acts of violence that targeted specifically Han civilians, which pretty much never happened before 2009, started to happen at a small rate. There's still a tiny part of Uyghur violent resistance. But um, so in, unfortunately, I think the government was successful in making um, the ethnic question central um, to uh, people's understanding of the problem. And then, of course, I think what <clears throat> some other people will probably talk about, the other main uh, thing that, that uh, I noticed, which was this incredible militarization. I mean, you, you, you felt like you were in a, 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 a military occupation, which is exactly what it was. You know, they pumped in huge numbers of people's <clears throat> armed police with military equipment. They were on every corner. They were parading around day and night. Um, and that, that, that was a change that, um, um, you know, we're still living with. Thank you for those um, really enlightening observations, Ryan. I'm sure there's a lot that I want to pick up on later, but um, I think now we can go to Sophie. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, first of all, to the UHRP and to uh, the World League of Congress for inviting me to join you. I also very much want to uh, take a, a moment and just express our deepest concerns about Uyghurs inside and outside the region and acknowledge the fear and the pain and the terror that those people have endured, but also state that we are in awe of people's resilience and courage in pushing back against this repression. I was thinking yesterday about, um, about those couple of weeks. <laughs> and I think one of the things I remember most vividly was one of the first pictures uh, of, of a group of Uyghur women uh, who were sort of up against a line of, uh, of police. Uh, it was one of the first images that was on the front pages of, of Western newspapers or being carried by Western wire services. And I just remember looking at it and thinking, this is what 50 years of repression brings. You know, this, is, this is what happens when people have no ability to have legitimate grievances responded to, to have you know, any sort of equality or equity or say in what's going on around them. Uh, you know, and and I, I certainly share um, Ryan's recollection about the militarization, just how quickly you know, very uh, heavily armed uh, troops moved in, that it wasn't just a question of what the local public security bureau was going to do, but that you saw you know, the PAP and other military units you know, dealing with, uh, uh, you know, a kind of protest that certainly didn't warrant that kind of a response. And, you know, I think as, as we as we sit here now in 2020 and think back to those times, I think the speed and the severity uh, and sort of the disproportionate nature of the state's response 
uh, I think is part of what we what we're we're seeing the downstream effects of now. Um, Nori, would be interested in sharing some of your your observations from two thousand nine as a follow up to. You know, yeah, I, I uh, first of all, um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Um, in the meantime, I like to pay tribute to uh, a tribute to those um, Uyghur workers uh, get killed in Shaoguan in 2009, um, and the the Uyghur uh, youth who started that peaceful protest end up disappearing, locked up, even get killed. Um, Two things uh, that seem to me very significant. One is um, the 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 events of 2009 and afterwards um, made the Chinese government to realize that uh, stick and po stick and carrot policy is not effective. So they given up on the carrot. Uh, they focus on the stick, as it has been uh, reported. Um, uh, that some of the Chinese uh, policy advisors, um, academics, uh, government officials decided that uh, giving the Uyghurs uh, materialistic satisfaction, uh, some uh, rights to uh, move around within the country and other side of the country, did not get them the type of loyalty uh, that the Communist Party was expecting. So that uh, that we have been uh, we have seen that uh, through the recently leaked uh, documents, uh, and also followed by Xi Jinping's trip to Urumqi in 2014. And the other thing uh, that comes to mind is that we've been telling the world, um, uh, those of us who advocate Uyghur rights, that uh, the the global uh, businesses need to pay attention to the forced labor issue way back. This is nothing new. So the shogun is one of the earliest uh, uh, unwanted casualties of the globalization. Uh, it happened in toy factory, uh, a U.S. toy factory. There were thousands of Uyghur youth uh, uh, transferred into uh, coastal assembly lines to work. And now, thank God that uh, we are having a real conversation about the uh, slavery, the modern day slavery that started way back. And also, uh, um, the the 2009 incident. Um, I hate to use the word riot, as you pointed out. I don't think it's an accurate. I don't think it's conscionable to even call it riot because it's not how it started. Those of you who were on the ground, I have not been back to uh, to the homeland 25 years. Uh, those of you who were there or uh, visited uh, may have heard that the Uyghur uh, protest is initially carrying Chinese flag in order to avoid getting into conflict with the uh, authorities. Um, so this event, I think, uh, helped to sanitize the Uyghur image a little bit in the public discussion. Before the nine, uh, 2009, bef uh, from 2001 through 2009, it's all about Guantanamo, all about terrorism. But uh, 2009 events changed the narrative a little bit uh, towards the factual and realistic and objective direction. So um, the Uyghur people both uh, blessed and cursed uh, with the 2009 uh, incidents. One, uh, it put the Uyghur issue on the map a little bit on positive uh, direction. At the same time, that paved the way for the Chinese to use uh, the, the, uh, the most repressive uh, methods of uh, uh, oppressing the Uyghur people. Now, being uh, again into the uh, point of a geno genocidal policy being implemented. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think what's already starting to come out from the comments we've gotten so far is just that <clears throat> this didn't come from nowhere. And of course, you know, the events of 2009 haven't just stayed in 2009 in some sort of vacuum, right? We're seeing the reverberations today. Um, now I'll give the floor to Ursula to kind of share some of her impressions and observations from that time. Mm -hmm. I thought immediately after the 2009 events that it reverberated what happened in in the Tibetan areas in 2008. If you remember, there were um, small-scale riots in Lhasa and then everywhere on the Tibetan plateau, uh, people who were unrest, real unrest, for the first time since many years. And then I thought 
well, it's coming to, to, to Uyghur land too. And um, it reminded me of the Gulja events 10 years earlier, where there had been really a very hard, very, very hard repression about, uh, in Gulja that we don't know about because very little transpired from the Gulja event. So Urumqi, I didn't know what was going on, but it, it seemed like the, all the minority areas were effervescent and that something was going on. Maybe it had to do with the, with the kind of, of um, treatment of the minorities um, situation by local um, uh, officials. Well, we know that at that time in Xinjiang, there was this guy called Wang Le Chuan who was a, a hardliner. And um, probably his policies were very, um, very hard, hardliner too. And then a, a year later, I met Ilham Tohti in Beijing uh, because I, I went to Beijing as a correspondent at the end of 2009, same year. And I met Ilham Tohti just a couple of months later. And he told me that the situation was really getting worse and worse. The situation was really um, terrible on many, many different fronts. So that this wasn't uh, just uh, something that happened by chance. It was the result of an accumulation of very, very harsh policies for years and years. Um, and I must say that I was a bit afraid because I saw how the Chinese regime reacted in Lhasa um, because I went to Lhasa three months after the, 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 the unrest and it was terrifying. And I thought that it would have been even worse in the Xinjiang region. Interesting. Thank you for those observations. Um, you know, you specifically mentioned this this accumulation of harsh policies, right, that have been going on over years and years. And so, um, to Adrian, I want to ask a slightly different question related to the same one I, that I've just asked all of you. But um, I think Adrian could really give a lot of insight into what some of those policies were, <clears throat> what were the ethnic and developmental policies that had accumulated in those years leading up to 2009. Broad strokes are fine. <laughs> but how do you see those connected to the events that occurred? Yes, um, in fact, that was exactly my perception of the events in Urumqi when I, I also like uh, Ursula came uh, to, the, to the July 5th with a very uh, Tibetan focused uh, angle. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, first the Tibetans rise up in 2008, then the Uyghurs in 2009. Those are basically the two largest sort of restive, uh, politically uh, problematic, quote unquote, um, ethnic groups in China with very distinct identities and uh, very uh, contentious histories. Now, uh, and, and that marked, by the way, a turning point also in ethnic policy. Basically, when the Uyghurs joined uh, what the Tibetans had done, uh, although a different cause, but same underlying reason, it, it really dem it, it visibly demonstrated the failure of CCP ethnic policy of the end of the last of the preceding five to six decades. So um, what I see is that, of course, both of these ethnic groups went through uh, severe grievances during the time of the Cultural Revolution which has left a, a mark on them uh, to the state. And um, both groups then also significantly benefited from Deng Xiaoping's liberalization policy in the 80s and 90s. Um, there was a resurgence of um, um, language education, of uh, religious practice, of cultural practices um, during these times of leniency. But what happened in the 1990s and under Jiang Zemin was a, uh, a, dr a drastic change and reform in all of China. And <clears throat> the problem of these uh, socioeconomic or market reforms was that they greatly intensified um, inter-ethnic competition between the Han Chinese and the minorities. 
Um, in the middle 1990s, China liberalized its education system and um, entrance into higher education became competitive. Um, this uh, went along with a gradual dismantling of ethnic privilege and uh, led to a much intensified competition between minorities seeking to enter tertiary education and the Han. Now we have to understand, this is very significant because in these regions, um, for ethnic minorities, the primary route for upward social mo mobility are government jobs. Uh, private sector jobs, especially at that time, were not as uh, available, not as abundant, and um, much harder to obtain for minorities uh, versus the Han. In the government sector, there was still more protectionism and more opportunity for minorities to obtain a stable employment. However, this required a tertiary degree. To get a tertiary degree, you now have to compete. Um, so especially in the early 2000s, this really came fully to bear. At the same time, we also had the end of the uh, automatic job assignment system for university graduates, um, which came into effect in minority regions in the late 90s and early 2000s. Again, we had a strong um, sense of insecurity of uh, the ethnic minorities now having to compete for jobs, including for government jobs. And, and um, there was also a real shift of this competition uh, increasingly being predicated upon Chinese language skills. Whereas in the past, some minorities could get away with very little Chinese language skills and still um, go through the system or write on preferentiality and uh, secure a very good employment. Of course, this was an elite system, of course. But even so, the perception of this change was then coupled with the Great Western Development Initiative uh, initiated by uh, Jiang Zemin in 1999 and coming into force in the early 2000s. Now, in my latest research paper, I show some of these population and demographic changes where you see where, um, for example, in Xinjiang, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, Han annualized population change rates were much higher than of the Uyghurs due to massive in-migration. Then in the 1980s and early 1990s, Uyghur birth rates were higher than Han. There was stronger Uyghur population growth. Then again, that changed from the mid 90s, late 90s, quite drastically. You had a strong influx of Han Chinese, both into Xinjiang, into Qinghai, into Tibet, into all kinds of Western areas, um, who, who, who were the primary uh, benefactors of the billions of uh, uh, Chinese yuan that were poured into these regions through the Great Western Development Project, which did trickle down. And of course, there was some benefit for minorities in certain ways eventually as well. But all of this forms the back together, of course, with an ongoing <clears throat> situation of um, a feeling of cultural discrimination. Um, I feel that the, 2000, the, the late 90s, early 2000s were like a turning point but the minorities were pushing the boundaries of their cultural freedoms, their, their language freedoms, educational freedoms. Xinjiang in 2004 introduced, uh, started to push back first by introducing the bilingual language policy, which mm. boosted Han Chinese learning. In other parts, the, the Tibet Autonomous Region had um, experimented with um, secondary Tibetan language ed education very successfully, had a, a fair, increasingly well-developed tertiary Tibetan language education. In the late 90s, experimental classes in 97 were abolished after only one year, despite successes. All, the, all along the 2000s, we saw significant pushback in, for, in the form of sinicization and the gradual erosion of Tibetan language education. So I, I would see kind of these three vectors um, of uh, demographics, of the, um, the socioeconomic and the cultural linguistic spiritual, you could add into that, coming together and giving the minorities these mixed signals of you're part of China, you are, there's a preferentiality, there's, there's, a, there's an opening up, but that means now competing. And there is, um, there's, there's more competition, there's more money, there's more development, a lot of money is being poured in. But, but what's going on is the money, the money also uh, provided a very uh, problematic counterpoint to cultural freedoms in some respects, because it also enabled the state and the state built more structures also around like temples and, and mosques and everything. Everything became more institutionalized and also under more control. So 
I think it's actually no coincidence that all of this galvanized in the late 2000s. Sorry, that was a bit long. It might have been a bit long, but I, I think it was um, very valuable and really um, ties together a lot of big issues that we don't necessarily automatically think of when we think of July 5th, 2009. So thank you very much uh, for sharing all of that. So um, <clears throat> another question I would like to ask before we shift to adding in audience questions is that when we talk about July 5th, as I'm just saying right now, I'm still calling it July 5th. This is the shorthand that we use for talking about this event. Um, you know, I mentioned, and Nori also brought up the events in, in Shaoguan, right? That motivated the demonstrations in Urumqi on July 5th. It's well established that then for days and months afterward, July 5th had immediate reverberations in um, state intervention into everyday life in the region. Um, is there a more nuanced term or phrasing than just July 5th <laughs> that we could use to talk about these incidents or, or think about these incidents? Um, I'm curious to know if, if any of you has ever thought of this. I was inspired to ask this question by uh, Professor Jim Millward from Georgetown, who posted this on, on Twitter, actually, recently. So I'd be curious to hear any thoughts the panelists might have. I'm, I'm no historian, but maybe maybe the obvious um, the obvious reason why it's called July 5th is because that in in many ways was a pivotal day in terms of ethnic tensions erupting in in Xinjiang itself, and sort of no matter who died, who started what, sort of that was like probably the moment where a, a more localized uh, migrant-based conflict in, Guang, in, in Guangzhou, Guangdong um, uh, erupted into a wide-scale ethnic tension, or it, that, that is when the, like the underlying uh, rupture became visual, and at the same time, ethnic relations were changed forever, uh, even though, of course, the, you know, the July 6th and 7th you know, things happened, but I, I, I assume that uh, I'm not inherently trying to defend the terminology, but that's sort of the obvious, like it, it seems to be the pivot of the day. So maybe we can start with that, that argument. <laughs> um, I, you know, along with the question of the name is, is the terminology in it. Uh, I've, we've heard a couple of times the discomfort with the word riot, which is how the Chinese government wants to frame it. Of course, a riot implies no political purpose. It, it Im implies a kind of violence for its own um, sake. For me, whatever we, whatever I call it, I think needs to include the fact that there was violence, um, including violence perpetrated by Uyghurs on uh, Han civilians, and of course, massive state violence against um, uh, Uyghur civilians. Um, and for that reason, I kind of prefer to talk about um, uh, the Urumqi uprising, um, because an uprising implies that there are real grievances that have led people to protest. I mean, originally, of course, it, we, we, as we understand the event, it started as a protest, but I think a, a peaceful protest, but um, it did turn into a violent, a violent protest. And we have a word for that in English, uprising, um, which we also use for, um, urban rebellions and uprising um, in the US, for example, which are um, events from the you know, 60s and 70s that are now seen as justified um, pushbacks against uh, um, racial uh, oppression. Um, and it's also a word that um, has some uh, use in Chinese, right? So qi yi is a kind of can be a righteous thing for uh, the communist uh, uh, communist party. So th th these are the many reasons that I like uprising. It gets um, you know pushback from Han people who are angry that you know uh, innocent civilians um, were uh, were brutally killed. But I I think it 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 encapsulates the f the fact that there were real grievances uh, on the part of the people who who did engage uh, in, yeah, in violence. Like and of course 
the the July the, calling it July fifth is I think a um, is a is a a borrowing of a Chinese tradition of naming events by um, by dates uh, a communist Chinese communist Chinese era uh, well I guess it goes back earlier um, okay sorry gone a bit okay if I may, uh, yes uh, that's an excellent uh, uh, point. Um, thank, thank you, Ryan, that uh, you started um, that thoughtful terminology. Um, I, I've been hearing different ways, and I agree with that we need to be very careful with uh, literary translation of what the Chinese says. The Chinese call it Baodong. Uh, that's, that's, you know, and Chivu, it's not Chivu, it's not Baodong. Uh, so we got to be careful. And also something else that needs to be uh, addressed, which is the figure that they put out, 197. And, you know, how do we know that? Did anyone allow to go and meet, interview, uh, see the documents? Were there any independent in investigation? Were there any open source uh, verifiable information as uh, Adrian has been writing about? So there's, it, we need to be very, very careful from getting into the situation of copying and pasting what the Chinese propaganda machine tells us to do. Yeah, actually, so I might, um jump in right now. I know not everyone has responded to this question about the terminology, but there's a, a, a great audience question. Um, that's from Amy Rieger of the Congressional Executive Commission on China. And she has asked this. Up until recently, the majority of media organizations and other observers have continued to recycle Chinese authorities' figures regarding the numbers and demographics of deaths on and after July 5th. Do you think that in light of greater understanding that Chinese authorities have clearly and repeatedly lied about what happens in the Uyghur region, how can the press be prompted to revise the way that they describe what happened in the region in July 2000? I could answer okay. to that. <laughs> also, it's a general problem, in fact, in China. Anything that happens we have to rely on whatever the government says because there is no independent inquiry. If someone happens to be there, they can give their testimony, but they don't have the figures. The figures is the most difficult thing to get in China. So we use the official figures usually, but we always say, you know, these are official figures, but the independent uh, NGOs, um, have other other evaluation. Uh, for instance, in the case of the Urumqi um, incident, I have written about that many uh, times, and I ha have always said that there were hundreds of people killed, mostly Han people, on during this these, these five, six, seven July. But then thousands of young Uyghur males had disappeared from, from Urumqi uh, in the weeks and months following the, the event. And that was also uh, substantiated by, by testimonies, testimonies of families, of people who knew people who had disappeared. So there is no easy way to solve this question. We have to use the, the official figures, but then it's our job to say that it's, it's all propaganda. Elise, if I could just jump in briefly on sort of not so much the semantics point, um, but you know about the attributions of numbers, and maybe maybe the point in my mind that connects these is that you know I don't have a view about whether we call it July fifth or or I mean I think uprising maybe a more appropriate term. I think we continue to refer to protests that began peacefully, but I guess I now think of it as the beginning of the era of disappearances. You know, that's the issue that we wrote about in the immediate aftermath. And, you know, I was looking back yesterday at our report from that time, and I was trying, you know, Ursula, I strongly associate with what you've just described. I was trying to imagine how we would go about now finding out what happened to the 43 cases that we wrote about then. And indeed, you know, between the time that we had done those interviews, which would have been in I think late August or early September, and when we published that report in October, we were only able to get a little bit of follow-up information on one of those cases. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, I, and 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 again, in looking back yesterday, what we wrote in 2009, thinking about how 
you know, maddeningly resilient uh, the Chinese government's propaganda is because there's nothing, you know, there's no way to effectively challenge it. But I certainly take Amy's point that calling it out and, and saying that these are numbers that can't be corroborated, right? When, when, when we are obliged for purposes of reporting to use Chinese media sources, that we need to say so and that, you know, they can't be independently verified. And, you know, one of the reasons we push constantly for, you know, access to this region uh, is to have, you know, the ability to do some credible on the ground fact finding, you know, which Chinese uh, government officials obviously have a strong interest in blocking. I would add only that one of the reasons why, in my opinion, Ilan Toti was so harshly treated by the Chinese government, I remind that he is in prison for life. It's because he had documented some of those disappearance and he came out with a list of 37 nouns, 30, 37 people that he had found not through the Chinese press, but through his own uh, friends and, and people he knew. So that he he asked that those cases be be um, investigated by the by the officials, and he was harshly criticizing the government at that time. So I think that it's 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 the it's the saddest thing that thousands of people disappeared at that time. And when I went and in, in Urumqi in 2014, less than five years after this date, the people I met when they had they were trusting me enough they all told about about thousands of people disappearing young men in their 20s um anybody else have, have thoughts to add it looks like perhaps not so ursula since you just mentioned you know your your visit to Urumqi, uh, you know, not all that long, right? And in the time after these events unfolded, I, I know that you mentioned to me some um, sort of interesting and kind of unreported yes. things that you were able to learn. If you could expound on those a little bit for the benefit of everyone listening. Yes, yes. yes. I learned that at that time when, when the, the incident happened, the Chinese authorities didn't want the local police to do the um, uh, to do the control of the population and everything, and and they didn't want the local police to do the crack um, crackdown because they didn't want people to say that this was ethnic problems and that they used the Han majority Han Chinese policemen to do the crack crackdown on Uyghur population so that they called in Urumqi 500 policemen from other places in, in Xinjiang, mostly from the south, and they uh, just asked them to, to go on and to, to do the crackdown. And many of those disappearances have been done by many of those policemen under Chinese command, uh, certainly. And then those 500 policemen were rewarded by being uh, invited into Urumqi, by having uh, good jobs in, in the Urumqi uh, police system, and being uh, having flats given to them to, and their families. Uh, and there is a, a place where I went in 2014. It's the Dawansun area in the, in the southeast of Urumqi, where there are two high-rise buildings of 17 stores. Uh, and they um, they live there, and they don't live anymore in their in their small town in the southern Xinjiang, and they have been rewarded for doing the, the dirty job for for the for the government. Which certainly is a, a really interesting sort of observation and set of data points, and has echoes in in the way that you know in the ongoing campaign now. You know, the state has conscripted Uyghurs to police other Uyghurs. We know that so much of the surveillance and, you know, the locking away and so forth has has occurred because Uyghurs are working for the police, Uyghurs who have no other choice. That's really interesting. Well, from what I know, maybe, you know, also, it, it, it has been a constant policy mm -hmm. to use 
people inside the communities to control people, other people in the community. It's true also in Tibetan areas. It's in fact it's true everywhere. It's true even in Wukan, the, the small Chinese village who was who protested against the Chinese land grabs, etc. They always use people inside the communities just to split the communities. Divide and conquer, sort of. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make a quick uh, uh, point. Um, you know, I, I cannot complain about or saying anything negative about good journalists uh, who has been uh, uh, incredibly courageous and um, forceful in um, exposing the atrocities um, taking place. But sometimes I, I feel very uh, bothered, actually, uh, that uh, some of the media reportings um, use the terms like Xinjiang province, far western region, uh, Chinese Muslims when describing the Uyghurs in their homeland, and also um, some TV journalism also a problem showing uh, the bloody face uh, uh, Chinese individuals when they're describing the Uyghurs. I mean, it just fits it perfect into the Chinese narrative. So um, anyone who's watching from the media, I like to, uh, to ask them to be very careful uh, with the word choice because words matter. Uh, and uh, it is, um, you know, Uyghurs have very simple identity. They're Uyghur. They don't need to be added with any other ad adjective. And there's no such a thing called uh, Chinese American or Chinese uh, or Japanese American, as we get you as we are as we have in the United States when it comes to China. You just Uyghur, you Tibetan, and the rest. So uh, though and no adjective is required and needed, and it can be quite annoying uh, if if you call any Uyghur Chinese Uyghur or Chinese Muslim. They don't like it, so be respectful. I think the the, the problems of, of terminology and shorthand and our labeling conventions, you know, end up coming up quite a bit. And and to circle back to Ryan's comment, I think this, I I like the suggestion of uprising, for what it implies and um, and the kind of sense maybe more sensitive or nuanced way it could help us to talk about some of these events. I think that was a really good intervention of sorts. Um, we've had another question come in specifically about some of the events that led to July 5th. Uh, there's no identifying name with it, but uh, this question says, what can the panelists tell us about the background of the Xiaoguan incident, the role of ethnic rumors and the internet in spreading false rumors? So perhaps, you know, we would call this fake news now, although, <laughs> We weren't saying that then. Um, and so how did you know, ethnic rumors and the internet and the spread of false rumors also then play into what were already toxic stereotypes about minorities? It's a big set of questions I know, but you could start with just the Xiaoguan incident. Ryan? Okay. <laughs> well, um, of course, the um, uh, it's pretty clear that the um, the main spark for the protests was a video, um, which is uh, which shows um, Uyghur factory workers uh, being beaten to death in a, um, a, the residential uh, compound of a, of a toy factory and. Um, in the uh, southeastern China, and um, it's quite a graphic and disturbing um, video. There's, um, you know, there's no rumor about it. It's it is a very clear depiction of men being hunted down um, and and beaten to death. And I think the clarity of that video is what. Um, is what made it so powerful in 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 in, in mobilizing uh, people. Um, the backstory to the video, you know, which is hard to confirm, is that it the motivation for beating those workers was rumor that um, uh, was an unsubstantiated rumor that um, uh, Uyghur men had um, sexually assaulted uh, Chinese women in in the factory. And rumors did play a big role throughout the the the, the events in Arumchi and afterward. Um, when I was there, people were starting to talk about uh, there was this big scare of um, uh, people taking revenge by sticking uh, each other with 
uh, hypodermic needles on buses. And I mean, the rumors were uh, were constant. And that, you know, that's an effect of having no um, open media. You know, there, there are no good sources for information um, in Xinjiang, whether you're Han or a Uyghur, but even more so if you're um, a Uyghur. Um, and so people, People go with with what they can, and they don't trust state media, uh, Uyghurs, for good a very good reason. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of this. This can cause uh, this can cause problems. This can cause people to get out on the street. But the spark for the uprising itself was something that was pretty well, um, pretty clear, pretty well documented. Nori, do you have any thoughts to add? I'll call on um, you. Call on Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I, I think it, it is it is perfectly legitimate and reasonable for Uyghurs to show sympathy in a situation like this. As a Uyghur, I would be doing the same thing. I would be uh, on the street in Rimchi if I saw something like that. That my fellow Uyghur being beaten up in such a brutal way. I've seen the video still. That image still haunts me to this day. It's it's quite disturbing. Um, it, it, so, but instead of addressing the le, uh, legitimate con con concerns and uh, grievances, the Chinese government actually uh, let the people uh, go, go on the street. There is also rumors that uh, the, the events being announced in various websites, at least in three different websites, the Chinese did not prevent it from happening. So it begs the question, are they expecting, uh, uh, are they purposefully allowing uh, the Uyghurs to pour on the street and then they can uh, come up with the military and, and uh, armed police to uh, crack down? Uh, you know, it, there's a lot of unknown unknowns, uh, if I can borrow um, a, a former politician statement. Uh, but what I can say is that um, a, a normal government, uh, a responsible government will not act in a way that the Chinese did. The Financial Times reported that in 2009, they even ran out of space in prison. They used their house outside of Rimchi, locking up at least 40,000 people. So that shows how aggressive the Chinese government's response to what started as a peaceful demonstration. Wow. Um, thank you. I I would like to to, to go back to the the part of this question that, that specifically mentions how this played into toxic stereotypes about minorities. And, you know, as Ryan has already helpfully pointed out, there's a lot about the incidents that led to the actual, you know, beating and murdering of Uyghur men in Shaoguan that, uh, that are unsubstantiated, right? And we can't, there's a lot we can't necessarily know about them. But it, it does seem from the outside like they are connected, those events are connected or were to a certain set of stereotypes about minorities. I'm just I'm curious to know if any of you panelists have thoughts or comments to kind of add in there specifically regarding that, that bit. Yeah, I mean, Han, Han Chinese perceptions of um, a number of minorities, and that particularly applies to Tibetans and Uyghurs, um, are, are very clearly linked to both communist and pre-communist uh, narratives of these ethnic groups being very, um, well, uncivilized, I guess would be the official term. Uh, it kind of harkens more to a notion of barbarianism, um, ranging from uneducated to dirty to uh, undisciplined to uh, out of control to to capable of of uh, committing uh, low low acts um, and um, these kinds of notions and of course the related government narrative that minorities need to be civilized they need to be educated they need, they need to be brought up to speed with Han culture and other things um, that have been cultivated over a long amount of time, and of course, justify the notion of the Chinese nation, the Zhonghua Minzu, the, the, the multicultural China, you know, 56 quote unquote ethnic minorities. Um, all of these narratives greatly um, play into 
hunt perceptions of minorities that would very quickly interpret their actions negative would be highly liable to believe that minorities perpetrate um, uh, low low acts against uh, the Han, etc., and therefore uh, the minorities need to be governed with a strong hand. Um, there's a, there's a really strong connection of narratives that would very easily play into both believing almost any rumor about what minorities are capable of doing, and then also justifying a strong government response. And of course, that's ongoing. You know, um, vocational internment camps, etc. You know. Uh, re-educating a, a violent ethnic group, uh, quote unquote, uh, all of that is is linked and ongoing. <clears throat> I, I would just add to that. You know, when I when I think back over the last half dozen, possibly even all of the reports that Human Rights Watch has produced, uh, you know, in the last ten or fifteen years on uh, about about Uyghurs or about Tibetans, they could all have been titled, they say we should be grateful. We've titled at least one that, you know, because I think the Chinese government also just, you know, constantly harps on this narrative of its tremendous largesse and its kindness and its, you know, this incredibly patronizing, uh, you know, effectively, you know, racist rhetoric that, it, you know, it has lifted these communities up and somehow you know, civilized them and brought them into modernity. And it's, you know, and that's a, a narrative I think the government really goes out of its way to ram down people's throats. That has the net effect. Again, when you have no, no access to independent information, you know, other people then form a perception that these, these communities are somehow uniquely privileged in ways that they aren't. You think about, for example, you know, birth control policies and, you know, that the ethnic minorities are so benevolently allowed to have more children. And I think it really feeds this narrative, you know, whereby people think, you know, what are these people complaining about? They've been so well looked after and why, you know, why aren't they grateful? And, you know, if I had a buck for every interview we've done in which, you know, somebody quotes that idea or some variation on it, you know, that, that not only are people expected to deal with extraordinary repression, but they're expected to turn around and be grateful for it. I could have retired a long time ago. Yeah, um, that has echoes in what the scholar Emily Ye has written about indebtedness engineering, specifically in Tibet, but we can yeah. see that dynamic at play, I, yeah, with a lot of groups across China. I can say also that when I was expelled from China, it was there was a one month and a half uh, between the moment when I wrote my article and there was this campaign on internet against me and the moment I had to leave China. During this month and a half, there were uh, thousands of people who flocked on my Facebook page and who littered it with lots and lots and lots of, of unspeakable things, but some of them were trying to make me understand how my position was wrong because they said, you are protecting people who are ungrateful. And they were really sincere with this idea that China had, had given so much to the minorities and that the, the ordinary Chinese people, they, they thought that they were ordinary people. They didn't have all those privileges. And they were using the term privilege. And they said, uh, uh, when, sometimes I had a, a very weird uh, dialogue with them. And they, I said, what privilege? And they said, you know, they can have more than one baby. And then they, can, they have special treatment for going to university, et cetera, et cetera. And then I told them, but how many uh, people did you see uh, coming out from universities who are not Han Chinese. Have you seen so many of them? And they didn't have really any precise idea. It was all this fuzzy thinking that was vehiculated by the, by the, by, by the, by the official propaganda. But it was a very strange thing to observe because the Chinese official discourse didn't want to make difference between the 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 the, the minzus, you know, the Han Hanzu and the, and the Shaoshu minzu, the the minorities. They they pretended that they were treating everyone the same way, uh, except for some affirmative action 
for for the minorities but for the rest it was the same which was totally false but the people believe that 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 the that the government for some very strange reason was uh, doing favors to the minorities they were you know really they believed that speaking of the uh, <coughs> um, um, a preferential treatment when I look at the uh, type of people that the Chinese uh, start to round up in 2000, uh, late 2016, early 2017, um, it come, what comes to mind is the those people who have been treated preferentially, mm -hmm. um, allowing them to build business enterprises, um, allowing them al those who are allowed to travel outside of the country, um, build schools, uh, even some of them build mosques. Uh, so, it, it, it just uh, makes me wonder if those people were unwanted casualties of this uh, preferential treatment. Uh, or was it even um, it done by design? Um, you know, I've tried, I, I, you know, Sophie knows this very well. I, I haven't seen my mother uh, for 16 years. They used to be able to travel to the United States, no criminal history, no nothing. Uh, in fact, my father was a professor for 30 years at a local university in Kashgar. Um, with that kind of clean sleep uh, background, I could not get their passport, whereas the Chinese allowing some Uyghurs to travel, was it a paving the way to build this artificial data, uh, 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 a massive uh, 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 personal information collection effort that the Chinese started? So, you know, I, I, am, I am very, very uh, interested to know if somebody will figure this out, that if there's any purpose of allowing some uh, hand-picked Uyghurs or group of Uyghurs to be benefited from the uh, the earlier point I've made, uh, the carrot, um, uh, uh, selective prosperity, and now they're all gone. All, all the university professors that uh, Ryan and, and and Ursula and uh, Elise know or worked with are gone. All of the business elites are gone. All of the social elites are gone. All of the uh, custodians of the Uyghur cultural heritage is gone, and they are the beneficiaries of that preferential treatment, if you will. Yeah. It's a very um, sobering sort of reminder of, of where this has all ended up going, I think. Um, I have another question specific that came in specifically about the uprising. Um, this is from Kevin Kind of Johns Hopkins, and it can be to, to everyone on the panel. Um, he writes, it seems to me the 2009 massacre is a kind of Tiananmen Square for the Uyghur people. After Tiananmen, the government had a huge push to shape the narrative in the minds of Chinese people. How did the larger Uyghur community in the Uyghur region react to the government's narrative of what happened? And what collections of truths and rumors define how Uyghurs understand the 2009 massacre today? I think maybe, Nori, if you want to jump in first. That's a, it's, it's obviously a big question, but I think all of, all of you probably have some things to contribute to that in some way, but we can start with Nori. Would you mind rephrasing your question? I got distracted a little bit. Um, no problem. It is, it's a big one. Um, <laughs> how did the larger Uyghur community in the Uyghur region react to the government narrative of what happened? And how um, do you understand those events today? The Uyghur people have, uh, have a habit or tradition of taking whatever the uh, Chinese government or Xinhua the CCTV says in the opposite way. Um, after the 2009 um, uh, uprising, the Chinese put um, uh, several hemphic Uyghur activists in front of camera holding a sky blue flag, condemning them. Actually, that um, worked the other way around. It gave the Uyghurs belief that, thank God, there's some people speaking out on our behalf. I thought we were forgotten. Similar thing are happening. Uh, recently, after the enactment of the Uyghur uh, Act, the China is doing exactly the same thing. Uh, and then it just basically telling the Uyghurs that the United States Congress is going after the Chinese government. So um, it depends how you see it, but um, it's not by design, by I think by it's, uh, it's an, uh, it, it's a, it's a uh, the Chinese government think it's an effective method, but uh, to the, it, it, it is the opposite. 
Um, that's the nice way of we getting informed about what's happening outside the world. Yeah, I, uh, to, to add to that, uh, just to give you some uh, on the ground examples, um, in, in the southern part of the region, in Kashgar, Yek, and Khotan, um, uh, before 2009, not that I talked about Uyghur, I, I, I tried to avoid talking about sort of uh, 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 explicit politics of independence and things like that, because that's not what I was working on when I did research there. But um, the name Rebbe Akader, who was the uh, uh, exile leader in the uh, Uyghur exile leader in the West, uh, much despised by the Chinese government, never came up before 2009. And of course, uh, after the Urumqi uprising, the Chinese government spun this tale that Rebbe Akader was behind the whole thing. And they had this uh, um, sort of conspiracy theory documentary running on the televisions all the time. And they actually took military trucks around the south with giant loudspeakers on them. And they were touring around even small towns um, talking about how Rebbe Akader was a tax fraud and all of this stuff. Everybody knew who Rebbe Akader was, and they figured she must be a really wonderful person to the extent <laughs> that I walked into a tea house um, uh, in the weeks after the uprising in one of these uh, uh, southern towns. I walked in and I said, hello, and somebody in the tea house shouted, we are all Rebbe Akader's relatives. And the whole tea house said, yeah, and I, I couldn't believe it because, I mean, of course, that was really dangerous, but that kind of thing would never have happened. So the, in my, you know, anecdotal impressions from, from uh, traveling around there, they, they made Rabbi Akader a household name and a hero. Um, she went from a rather obscure figure within the rural parts of, of the Uyghur region to one that was well known. Yeah, in 2011, actually, I was uh, I took a bus to visit a Sufi shrine outside of Khoten. And when I arrived at the shrine, the bus driver told me, wait, 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 don't get off the bus yet. Waited for everybody else to get off the bus and asked if I knew Rabia Qadr. And I said, I know who she is. I don't know her personally. And he said, I'm not going to take money from you for riding this bus today because I want you to tell her someday that a bus driver back in Khoten says hello. Um, <laughs> right? And so I th just just a, a, another little anecdotal point to say I've had, I think, similar experiences. Um, but just a quick point you know, to follow up on, on what Ryan has just described, you know, that we're that we're seeing right now that I think reflects this this pathology on Beijing's part. Who talks incessantly about Hong Kong independence? That would be Beijing. <laughs> yeah, you know, they sort of get stuck in mm -hmm. in their own, you know, narratives, and and I think this blame game, that you know, is just devoid of real logic. And I think all, you know the net effect is in flagging up ideas or individuals who you know that previously maybe hadn't been so well known or hadn't been so well discussed. It just happens again and again. But I think it's. You know, I think it's one of the pathologies of authoritarian regimes. The, uh, yes, I'd like to follow up on that thought um, and on the previous thoughts uh, of Nuri and Ryan. Um, those, uh, there is the Chinese government response to the Lhasa and Urumqi uh, uprisings, um, I think was decisive and def has defined everything since because the Chinese government decided to blanket out its own responsibility, deflect responsibility to uh, external agents, as it does in Hong Kong, um, went fully on that logic, did not adjust its own policy, and introduced a logic of ever-increasing repression and violence that has defined these ethnic relations ever since. Of course, before it was there too, but it's become the dominant logic since. And I may add, you know, the, the, the kind of police state that was built up in Tibet and, of course, uh, so predominantly in Xinjiang, and the logic of violence and repression is the logical uh, outcome of the Chinese government response to the eruption of ethnic sentiment 
and a non-adjustment uh, to legitimate grievances. And I think so, that's also, I think, why this event is so significant today, uh, looking at the Urumqi uh, uprising, looking at this event, this pivotal event, and understanding how, uh, the logic that has followed ever since. And also now, and this, this is now spilling out also in Chinese <clears throat> foreign policy, the way, uh, like, if you look at border tensions, India-China border tensions, you know, the military moving into Tibet, to uh, fortify the border to uh, India, this whole uh, the logic of hard power or sharp power uh, is dominating both domestic Chinese politics and China's international outlook. And so I think that really is the big picture. I would like to uh, add something. Um, there was this very uh, strange incident when uh, people sent by the Dalai Lama went to uh, to Tibet to, to have um, talks with local people. And then the, 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 the officials were quite confident that they could invite those persons and that it would be okay. But then when those people showed up and there were thousands, tens of thousands of people who came just to have a look at, at them and just to touch them, etc. And then it was a huge surprise for the Chinese government so that they didn't imagine that after all the goodwill and all the privileges they had bestowed on the Tibetan areas, the Tibetans should still be very attached to the Dalai Lama. I think there is the same kind of ignorance of what is the people's heart. In the minority areas, there was. And my, my thought now is that now they know now they know that there is no goodwill on behalf of those uh, minorities for a very simple reason, because they were, they were mistreated for such a long time. But now that they know, they have take off the gloves and they are boxing without gloves. I think that's the, the, the worst part of it. They know better, they have no illusions, and they are going really very hard. This um, do they do the authorities know what the opinion of the most repressed minority groups really is? It's a, I think a very interesting question, and I hope I live long enough to read some nice historical mm -hmm. works on it in a couple of decades. Because um, I think that my my impression is that the 2009 uprising was a surprise to the uh, Chinese mm -hmm. authorities. Um, and their initial response was to seek evidence that um, Uyghurs are actually quite happy with the state. And you had a f several years after that in which there was a big industry, academic industry, of producing uh, ethnic unity research in which social scientists go um, into Uyghur, heavily Uyghur areas and do interviews and ask people um, how they feel about ethnic relations. And of course, the results always came back saying that Uyghurs are extremely happy because these are, you know, state uh, 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 state researchers doing this. Um, and so they created a kind of, uh, I used to call it the great leap of ethnic unity because they created this huge amount of fake data that they seem to be acting on that Uyghurs ordinary Uyghurs were quite happy. It was a few bad actors, a few bad apples, some of them influenced by outside, that were causing trouble. Um, and in that respect, I think, you know, 2009 is a turning point only in an indirect way, because we see around 2013 or 14, 15 under Xi, he elevates the very a, a minority of academics, or his people below him, the um, minority of academics who did see um, minority or, or uh, minoritized people's disconsent, they get elevated um, and they start uh, informing the people at the top. And you get this turn in the policy where you start to see a recognition, not just in the way the party talks, but the way the party acts um, and starts to see Uyghurs as inherently by virtue of being Uyghur disloyal. And that's where we are now. That's where we've been for the last three years, as every expression of Uyghurness becomes an expression of anti-party 
ness. Um, nice. But that wasn't the yeah. initial response of the state after 2009. The initial response was to buttress the narrative that most Uyghurs are happy and it's a few bad actors. Now it's most Uyghurs are bad actors and there are few people who might be trustworthy. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation and very well put, I think, um, pithily <laughs> expressed. Um, we're getting a lot of questions coming in that are kind of shifting from these events are, that happened on and around July 5th, the Urumqi uprising, to the things that we know are happening um, in 2017 to the present, which, as Ryan just pointed out, really go back to this big shift probably that happened in 2013-14. So um, we might kind of see this as the turning point in our event to discuss how the Urumqi uprising connects to what's going on right now. Um, yeah, I, I, I like, Ryan, what you just said about how, you know, 2009 was maybe only a turning point in an indirect way, because I hadn't necessarily thought of it like that myself before. Um, I'm curious to hear from all of the panelists, um, given all that we know now and given what we know is happening now in the Uyghur region, uh, <clears throat> Do you understand 2009, do you understand the Urumqi uprising in a different way than you did when it was happening? And if so, how? I see some thinking faces. I guess we, we did not expect and would not have predicted uh, some of the ongoing repressive, the extent and intensity of the, the current uh, repressions. Um, just as we might not have predicted Xi Jinping's um, global ambitions and policy from um, Hu Jintao. But looking back uh, is always easier. And I think looking back, I actually see a very logical progression of both. You know, there's recent talk about, you know, Xi Jinping's uh, turn to a more aggressive foreign policy stance is actually quite, in some ways, quite consistent with original ambitions. And the reintroduction of domestic focus on ideology is also actually quite consistent with Deng Xiaoping uh, pushing more like a pause button on ideology and saying, okay, we got to have that economic base going up. Let's, let's put ideology to the side. We can't afford this now. And I think with the ethnic relations, I think as I said, um, you know, the, the decision made by the Chinese state to go into denial and into different forms of repression. Um, what is going, and I might add not just of minorities, but also of the Han. If you look at um, Han religious groups, if you look at Falun Gong, if you look at house church Christians, if you look at Han, at the dissidents, you know, actually it's across the board and it's consistent and it's not just towards the minorities. Mm -hmm. And so I think we see actually um, a logical unfolding of a, a, a logic of repression that um, uses whatever means are necessary. And of course, mm -hmm. re-education and all these things have um, a, a, actually a long tradition, of course, in China, it's just not on this scale and not as a normalizing of governing society. Um, but at the same time, I think maybe surprising is the speed and intensity. That might be surprising. The speed and the intensity, some of us might have predicted this maybe 10 years later, if things keep going down the drain, it's just happened faster and a greater intensity. But um, I think I would see a great deal of consistency and uh, not as much exceptionalism as might have been attributed to the most recent strategies. May I just add a, a little bit of a different point? Uh, of course, I don't in any way want to downplay what happened in July 2009. Uh, but one other, I think, policy or, or practice that 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 gets left out of the equation that's relevant, or that 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 looking back was perhaps telling about where we are now, was the the this I think the distinct and, and singular focus on hunting down uh, Uyghur refugees and asylum seekers and forcing other governments to send them back. I think at the time, 
you know, we treated those as, you know, obviously somewhat connected uh, incidents. But I think if we had added that into what we saw in July 2009 and some of the other policies, and that, that's something I look back on and wish that we had understood it more clearly as evidence of a broader change in attitude and policy and a hardening. Because, you know, let's be clear, most governments are perfectly happy to be rid of asylum seekers or, or refugees. They want them to leave. They don't go and make an effort to get them sent back. And this was quite different. Uh, you know, we certainly watched over the years the ways that the Chinese government has harassed diaspora communities, you know, or, or, or even, you know, people from the Chinese pro-democracy movement, for example. But the practice of forcing, of hunting those kinds of people down and forcing them to go back and, and understanding the logic that underpins that effort, I think is another, is another piece of the puzzle that, that maybe could have told us a little bit more about where we were going to wind up now. Nori, please. Yeah, um, a few thoughts. Um, one, um, I don't think that anyone was expecting uh, the level of brutality, the repression um, that would unfold in such a short period of time. Um, I think it's fair to say that most of us follow, observe, um, monitor the events uh, of pol Chinese policies uh, caught off guard. Um, with the level of uh, repression, the scope and scale that we have seen. Uh, and then two, um, I didn't think that the Chinese will be shifting from the, um, the ethnic policy um, to uh, what has been accurately described as genocidal policy, uh, which is quite remarkable. The China has very uh, nicely written constitution, autonomy law, uh, as Ilham Tohti uh, called on the government to implement. Um, had they followed their own laws and regulations, even counterterrorism law, we may not have seen what we've seen today. And also, um, I am uh, somewhat disturbed by uh, the uh, lukewarm or no response from the international community. Um, we've all been raising this in various forms, but um, what is the meaning of never again if it's not taken seriously? Is that just a way of educating our uh, young, younger generation at school that uh, no one should be uh, persecuted, punished for, uh, for their religious ethnic background? But when it comes to reality, uh, the real action, time for action, we need to look at the economic aspect, geopolitical aspect. So I, it, it, that, that powerful statement increasingly become almost meaningless to me. Uh, on a personal level. Um, in a words are nice, the actions are better. Um, I, I am somewhat dumbfounded by some European countries, namely uh, Germany uh, uh, and, and maybe France um, that have survived uh, fascism in Nazi Germany, still tiptoeing around. Um, they're not, they should be leading the effort. They should be leading this effort, this is not about the United States government or Trump administration. Speaking out on this uh, crime uh, is, is a moral issue. Um, um, if I may borrow uh, Adrian's a powerful statement at the Hudson panel, that the world continuing to uh, allow the Chinese to test the conscience of the people in the free world. I think that should stop. So these are kind of things on the personal reflection that I'm, I, I am still very, uh, uh, to the extent disturbed that we have not seen the level of reaction that we'd have seen under the normal circumstance. Yeah, that um, kind of leads nicely into a question from Dr. Veena Ramachandran from the, the Birla Institute of Technology and Science in India, who has asked, um, who, have, who has said, I am curious about the Western governments and their sincerity in protecting the rights of Uyghurs. And do you think China is quite skillfully defeating the West in its own game? Um, I'm a government official, so let me take that question. Um, <laughs> and then because uh, you're a government official, I'm gonna criticize it. Yeah, you can <laughs> criticize me, uh, but um, no, um, no cussing for the purposes of <laughs> this conversation. Um, okay, Sophie. Um, no constraining my freedom of expression. Right? 
So we um, won't mention John Bolton here. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I think it's a fair question um, uh, in light of what is being discussed in public. But I, I, I as an, as a, um, um, as an American citizen, uh, I am proud of my adoptive country. The things that has been shown um, on bipartisan and bicameral level, and the, 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 uh, uh, the reporting and writing by um, uh, uh, academic and experts like yourself um, put the Uyghur issue in, uh, in the, on the map in a daily conversation. I used to look for uh, newspaper articles to read uh, about the Uyghurs, but now I cannot even keep up with it. Um, it is just it is it's just as heartwarming to see the level of interest um, and sympathy. I, I I meet with people in a, uh, a policy circle regularly. Um, I am uh, I am heartened by the level of concern being expressed. So I, I yes, it is it is somewhat linked to the U.S. national uh, national security interests, particularly in the uh, in the areas of uh, supply chain, uh, the forced labor, because the uh, the uh, the products produced by uh, modern slaves, the Uyghurs, uh, reaching to our stores. Um, uh, so it is it is in the United States national security interest, economic interest, but it is more moral issue. Like I cannot, um, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I we have uh, we have a history in this country, the cotton plantation, uh, slavery. So when whenever the the topic cotton produced um, cotton products produced by forced labor, that gets people's attention. So even if the China and the United States did not have any conflict, ongoing economic conflict or uh, you know public uh, public disagreements, there's a moral issue at stake. There's a historic parallel, both in Europe and here in the United States. So I call on those who are being very skeptical about the position that the United States government has taken, instead of focusing on that, let's focus on the ones who has not taken a position. Sophie, any thoughts? I, I, I see it in the face. <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts. Um, I'm, 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 I'm struggling to organize them into, into a succinct response, uh, which is that you know, while we have seen certainly more rhetoric uh, about you know, these horrific human rights violations committed against Uyghurs, uh, relatively little of that anywhere has translated into consequential policies. We've got, you know, and I don't, I don't mean to uh, downplay things like, for example, the Weird Human Rights Policy Act, um, which has just been signed into law. But, you know, let's be clear both that that was driven by the Congress, not by the administration, and that some of the strongest teeth that were originally in that bill got taken out. They may live to see another day in other bills, uh, you know, we've got some export controls from the U.S. We've got, you know, a few other, a few other modest steps. I don't think any of it rises to the level of, you know, the scope and the scale of the abuses that are going on. And, you know, and that's, that's, you know, in the U.S. is, is the country that's, that's put in place any meaningful policy responses over Xinjiang. The rest have really all been rhetorical. And, you know, there's, I think there's much to be said about uh, the weaknesses of some of the key international institutions, uh, particularly with, across the UN system, that exist precisely to deal with crises like these. And let's bear in mind that you know, since uh, 2017, uh, when the crisis for Uyghurs has really sort of exploded into uh, greater con popular consciousness, we've seen the UN Human Rights Council or other UN bodies with, with human rights mandates carry out fact-finding missions uh, or other kinds of, of special efforts to look at serious human rights violations. And I just scribbled down this list. I may be forgetting a few. Myanmar, North Korea, Libya, and Syria. Are we anywhere near an effort like that for Xinjiang? Nope. All we've got still are you know, these incredibly fragile joint statements, not votable texts. You know, these, you know these, these joint statements are incredibly difficult to coax governments to sign on to. 
asking for access to be able to carry out an investigation without even prejudging the, the, the outcome of such an investigation. You know, I think we can probably all reasonably assume that if any other government in the world was carrying out human rights violations of this scope and scale against a particular ethnic or religious community, we would be much closer to the accountability end of the equation than we are now. And I think it's a powerful testament uh, you know, to, to you know, the, the power that China uh, uh, deploys across the UN system. And in that sense, you know, I have to say, it's, it's very nice that the US has taken these two or three steps, but walking away from the UN Human Rights Council was the dumbest and most enabling thing that a government could have done in trying to resolve this crisis. And if that does not change, I really fear that any kind of accountability proceedings are, are highly unlikely. In the best of circumstances, it's one mother of a fight. <laughs> but these are not the best of circumstances. And if governments aren't all in on an effort like that, then Mary, I agree with you in the sense that they have abandoned both their legal and their moral obligations to defend human rights worldwide. Thank you. I would jump in a conversation um, by sort of making the making the point that however little and late the United States has done and is doing um, must be appraised as being approximately 100% better than what just about anybody else has done, which, you know, uh, a little is about 100% better than zero. And uh, I'm talking, you know, specific actions, even putting out policy advisories. Um, the main problem I see is the isolation of the United States and the lack of multilateralism. Uh, China has successfully been dividing uh, the international community and uh, the elite capture at the United Nations has become very severe. And uh, whatever the United States is doing is, of course, also being interpreted in light of its own uh, current motivations, right or wrong. And what I see is a, a severe lack of multilateral action. The, the United Nations is taking far too many unilateral steps. It has um, lost a lot of ground in terms of its international um, alliances and reputation with other countries, especially Europe. And I think that is a, a key weakness. However, this key weakness is complemented by a severe lack of both, both verbal and, and actual action on the side of the European Union. I mean, Absolutely. the European Union has not even, and, and its member countries, I might add, has not even barely spoken out on the matter, hardly at all, besides little blips and uh, and bits and pieces. So, so um, the shortcomings of the European Union in terms of, and to some extent Britain, although there's there's change coming in Britain, um, is 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 quite staggering. And of course, the European Union does is is a complex consensual based body. It does. It can only speak uh, when the members agree, and so that's understandable at a, uh, to an extent. But but the member countries, and I fully accept the blame laid on Germany. Um, I accept that blame. Uh, well, not I, not I, but I would agree with that blame 100%. And um, what what I would say, I would very strongly highlight the shortcomings that are there and the shortcomings at the United Nations. And I think. I, I, I think China is actually quite smart in exploiting some of these systemic weaknesses, uh, as we can also tell from the weakening of the of the uh, European Union, and notably the initiative, the diplomatic initiative that came uh, uh, yesterday at the United Nations from 27 countries led by the uh, United Kingdom, uh, notably missing in this were countries such as uh, Greece. Most Eastern European countries, except the Baltics, who have adopted a much stronger stance, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, I think that is uh, that is uh, highly concerning. The lack of unity on the side of the sort of 
what we might maybe loosely term the democratic world. Of course, it's it's Western dominated, and I guess one can open up the can of worms really and ask, okay, how about um, what's what's the human rights appraisal uh, in countries uh, of the Xinjiang, the Uyghur situation in countries uh, around the world? Uh, how about the Muslim world? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so. Um, Anyways, that would be sort of, it's a complicated situation. I think there's a justified criticism of the United States. I would, uh, I would see much more severe shortcomings, to be honest, in Europe in, the, in terms of the response. Um, and, I think, and I think this also characterizes where we're at because we are no longer at a stage where more evidence is needed, is really needed. I mean, evidence is nice. Yeah. Uh, and now, uh, since this week, we can... We can, we, uh, I guess the debate this week has sort of moved the discussion a bit closer to looking at the possibility of genocide or aspects of genocide or forms of genocide, etc. cetera. Um, but the, the biggest question is now, okay, so, so where, where does this leave at? So we know uh, thousands, maybe over a million Uyghurs are in camps or have been in camps. There's forced labor, there's abortion, there's sterilization. There's parent-child separation. There's boarding schools. So what? I, um, <clears throat> I, you know, I, 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 I agree with Sophie and um, Adrian. Um, simply put, we need bigger boat um, uh, oh. to tackle this uh, enormous challenge. Um, U.S. driven from the world stage, um, kind of doing it bilaterally instead of multilaterally, is is one of the problems. Um, that is not uh, 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 yielding any good result. Um, it, but at the same time, um, I, I call on people around the world uh, to, to don't second guess uh, what the United States has been doing on behalf of the Uyghurs. Um, this has been very, very common uh, misperception in the Muslim streets. Uh, I talked to people um, from the Middle Eastern countries. Uh, they think this, there's still some well-educated people, well-informed people believe that the United States government created this problem to prevent the China rise, which is which is ridiculous. So I, you know, I I, I call on uh, the countries around the world um, to show some leadership. Um, I'm not advocating uh, the Cold War 2.0, but what I'm educating is a global response. Uh, get on the right side of history. It's not difficult. Uh, it's a matter of conscience. It's not that difficult. Actually, this will protect your economic interest. Speaking out on this, this is how you get the Chinese government's attention. If you take, if you call them out publicly, and if you uh, if you uh, if you focus on their economic interests, they will pay attention to you. Um, I, I would like to address the one of the key parts of the question here that we haven't talked about much yet, which is the idea of hypocrisy. And that's a moral question. So to do that, I, I, I have to speak personally and not as a, a, a scholar here. Um, but I, you know, there are no states or institutions in the world today which are not engaged in some pretty terrible um, abuses of various rights. And I personally welcome hypocritical promotion of the good. I, I'm one of the people who's quite happy when the Chinese state produces its human rights condemnation of American uh, uh, systemic racism. Um, and I'm quite happy. I would, I think a, a lot of people would be overjoyed if Saudi Arabia, which has one of the worst human rights records uh, on the planet, were to come out and condemn what's happening. Um, to the weaker side, I wouldn't say, well, this is meaningless because of Saudi Arabia's treatment of women, right? Um, all of these, and, and so I'm also happy to see the U.S. Um, criticize China's racist policies of assimilation and uh, now genocide, um, despite having its own uh, violent racist policing system. Um, I think that these hypocritical promotions of the good bolster an international discourse which says it is not okay to do these kinds of things. And I'm not willing to discount these valuable uh, messages uh, simply because the speakers um, have, have their own failings. Very good point, I'd yeah. say. Yeah, very good point. I mean, I guess otherwise none of us could say anything, right? 
That's right. right. Demanding right. some sort of total ideological clean slate, pure <laughs> sort of approach doesn't exactly work, right? Um, we oh, have. Oh, go ahead, please. Just, just attack one quick point on that. And Ryan, to, to the point that you just made, I mean, watching the Chinese government's interventions around the debate at the Human Rights Council last week around the resolution on a commission's inquiry to look at you know, racism and police violence against uh, minorities in the US is, is language I can't wait to use because <laughs> You know, the, the, the hypocrisy there is just off the charts. And just to be very clear, Human Rights Watch is completely supportive of that effort at looking at abuses in the U.S. And there's a reason that we work worldwide holding all different kinds of governments, you know, to the international standards that they've signed up to. Uh, but, but the frustration I'm trying to highlight is that, you know, here we have the key U.N. human rights, the global human rights body, that's, that's able to move ahead with an investigation into these issues in the US or on the DPRK, but not China. And that's like, that I think is the reality that we all want very much to change. Uh -huh. Sophie, would you, would you like to say one or two sentences about Chinese, uh, the most recent sort of Chinese uh, inroads into controlling the human rights discourse at the United Nations? Because I think that's very significant as it pertains to this um, this situation here. I don't know if I can do it in one or two sentences, <laughs> but you know, we don't just live in a time now as when, when the Chinese government is literally trying to rewrite norms and concepts, trying, for example, to interject the idea of, quote, mutually beneficial cooperation uh, as the basis for human rights uh, discussions. And, and, and by that, it means uh, a, a, a human, an international human rights architecture that would only be for governments, and would not involve any sort of accountability. All of the, all of the upper, all of the, 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 the content would be governments in dialogue without any kind of consequences. Uh, and I'll spare you all of the details, but the Chinese government's resolution advancing this idea at the Human Rights Council did pass, but essentially with minority support, which is a step in the right direction. You know, last time around, only one government, the US opposed it, this time 15 did, or sorry, 16 did, 15, 16, I'll have to check. Uh, and a number of governments, uh, seven or eight abstained. And I think there's a growing awareness of not just the threat that that kind of language presents, but also the very aggressive ways the Chinese government operates within the council. It's we're, we're keeping an eye on one of Beijing's newer habits, which is to sign other governments up to Chinese government resolutions without necessarily asking those other governments first whether they want to be listed, leaving the other governments in the position of having to say to Beijing, no, no, we actually don't want to be on that, you know, which, especially for countries that are largely economically dependent on Chinese aid, is a very awkward position to be in. Um, you know, but but. But with, in, in the absence of, I think, a broad coalition of governments that are going to commit not just to responding forcefully to human rights violations against Uyghurs, we also need to see those governments come forward and commit to protecting that system. Because if, if that system weakens and really operates only in the ways that the Chinese government wants it to, you know, that has terrible consequences for human rights worldwide. But just to go back to a point that, that I think Ryan and Nuri were also making a little bit, if you look at, at the universe of governments that I think, or, or even publics that are you know, horrified at what's happening to Uyghurs, or, that, or who are horrified by what's happened in Hong Kong, or who are very angry about COVID and the Chinese government's role in you know, obscuring information and silencing whistleblowers, you know, that creates a little bit of a broader set of, of actors than in the past. And I think we may see some of that come to come, uh, you know, produce some momentum at institutions like the Human Rights Council. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, a lot of the responses that you've been giving so far have touched on questions that our attendees have asked in small ways. So we're definitely not going to have time to get to all of our questions, but I hope that some of you are, you know, some of the parallels to what's happening in the United States with discussions about Black Lives Matter, 
right, you've brought up, and we had some questions about that. So um, thank you so much. I want to shift, though. We're we're nearing the uh, the mark of 15 minutes left, or we are at the mark of 15 minutes left in this event. And so I want to shift the discussion to talking uh, a bit about a few other things. Um, we have one question. This is just one more policy-related question from Omar Hosino, who is the foreign policy advisor for the House Republican Study Committee. And he wants to know um, what the panelists think about the idea of sanctioning the United Front. Um, they That committee recently put out a report calling for mandatory sanctions on the United Front Work Department, as well as some members of the CCP Politburo, partly for these human rights violations. Um, briefly, any thoughts from the panelists on that? Could you clarify if that refers to United Front uh, uh, operatives of some kind domestically in the United States or those in China? The question itself does not clarify that. Ah, I see. It's coming in. Those in China. Sorry, I guess I have a clarifying question too about whether whether the question is about the United Front uh, Work Department as a whole or individual members of it. That is a wonderful question that unfortunately we'll see if a clarification comes in. I, I now see a new clarification that says those in China and in the U.S. If I so. if I could, um, I you know the the uh, the sanctions are not punitive measure um, as you know. It is. Uh, it has a deterrence effect. So if you go after a government entity that does not have a business interest or travel interest to the United States, it will not be very effective. That kind of defeats the purpose of that um, uh, legal tool. But what should happen is that uh, the the sanctions effort should focus on individual government officials, policy advisors, and enforcers. That would that would be much more effective. So. Um, um, ideally, uh, the United States government should at least consider those names being sent to the uh, uh, Treasury Department and State Department at least two years ago. Um, uh, Sophie can correct me, but uh, since the GMA put in place in 2016, there's only one Chinese official have been sanctioned. Um, uh, that is wrong. Um, it's not that difficult. And the GMA, the Global Mag Magnitsky Sanction, should not be a, a matter of cherry picking. Whenever that becomes convenient for the United States government's a diplomatic engagement, it has to be a, some effective tool. And also the other governments um, um, that has a similar, they uh, have similar legal tools also should uh, uh, implement this. Uh, it's not, you know, uh, now it's different uh, with the uh, Uyghur Act being enacted uh, it's no longer a discretionary. It, it, it directs the president to implement that law. So the United States has lots of laws. Um, uh, as you may know, there's about 200 uh, draft legislation related to China currently being considered in the United States Congress. But once it's passed, once it's signed into law, the implementation is more important. So um, um, USERF has been calling on the administration to act swiftly to sanction uh, officials and entities as soon as possible. Um, this would be much more um, effective. Uh, and also it shows that the, 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 the public discussion is not about uh, the hampering China, right? This is about implementing US law. So uh, um, um, that's my comment. Thank you, thank you. Um, I wanna shift now to talking about the term genocide. Um, we write, which is on the table, I think, especially thanks to Adrian's new report that came out, um, Jamestown Foundation publication this week. Um, it's also in the title of this, this event, you know, from assimilation to cultural genocide, we called it at the time when we were conceiving of the event. Um, Noriman of Radio Free Asia's Uyghur Service wrote in a question for Adrian, um, which is, do you believe China is committing genocide? Um, and another participant, Isan Mani, has asked, 
what is the CPC's end game in this genocide? I'm an advocate of being relatively conservative with use of terminology because uh, terminology retains its power if it's accurately used. So mm -hmm. I think that's a very legitimate question. I think um, I have to admit I was at least uh, slightly surprised by my own findings. I did not uh, anticipate to find them. Um, it was kind of an extension of uh, research on population growth. And then I stumbled on onto various uh, things, which of course I was, you know, at least trying to look for. So, but um, to answer the question, I continue to maintain that the end goal of the CCP uh, is completely distinct from that of Adolf Hitler, who tried to eradicate the Jews, uh, saw them as an evil and dangerous race that needed to be wiped off from the earth. That was his ideology. The CCP ideology is to integrate the ethnic groups. The ethnic groups are like the the, the Uyghurs uh, and, and others are like the glory uh, of, of the Chinese empire, so to speak, the great uh, Chinese nation, uh, but they must be assimilated. And if they are naughty and don't behave, then uh, they must be assimilated, if need be, uh, very brutally. And this might involve uh, some of them dying in camps, and this might involve, uh, as we see now, a draconian population control. And... Um, Quite clearly, it is now, uh, I would say, probably accurate uh, to say that the Beijing's actions in Xinjiang are moving from a, a clear cultural genocide into meeting one of the five criteria for actual genocide. And of course, depending how you read the convention, you could say, uh, I, I still try to be a little uh, conservative and say, OK, maybe we qualify it. We say demographic genocide, that's not a clearly defined term. It has its issues. Um, uh, it's only the beginning of the debate. Um, to, to denote, in my opinion, it's, it's important to denote the fact that the CCP, I believe, is not trying to literally eradicate and physically kill, mass kill the Uyghurs. It's part of a extremely coercive campaign to control and change the Uyghurs, which at the moment involves suppressing their natural population growth to um, zero or, or possibly below zero. And this could be for a season. Um, demographic genocide is a term I have chosen to use. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's an initial way of characterizing it. It is up to legal experts to make a determination. I'm, I'm not a legal expert. I cannot make this determination. But clearly, this has opened up the debate at a new level. And I would invite uh, the others' comments on that. Nori? Um, I make a living by uh, working on compliance matters. The compliance is mitigating, uh, preventing things getting worse. We'll, get, get, um, we'll become a big legal issue. Um, in litigation, what we, uh, we call what Adrian has been telling us uh, through investigative reporting and, and relying on the actual uh, government documents is admissible evidence. Uh, what we have now, uh, especially since last fall, with the uh, uh, disclosure of secretive government documents, and now with the um, with uh, with the most recent uh, revelation by uh, um, Adrian, um, as a lawyer, I'm quite comfortable to say that this this fits the definition of genocide, and I don't think there are any adjective. Uh, I respect Adrian's position. He's a scholar. I'm a lawyer. We take a different position on matters. Uh, um, I, I think I think it's pretty clear. Uh, a slow motion uh, genocide is taking place, and those of us who are a student of history know that when the actual genocide is taking place, no one would know. I think that something similar is happening. So touching the actual physical body, a soul, is not really necessary. Um, uh, when they crafted and agreed on the uh, Genocide Convention, th uh, the world was a very different place. We live in a, a fundamentally different world uh, today. So I strictly interpreting, um, or based on the the, the, the language the text on the uh, uh, gen uh, uh, Genocide Convention, the prevent, that particular word is, is quite relatable. The Chinese government is through systematic, deliberate methods to prevent the population growth. Uh, that in of itself uh, should uh, qualify the Chinese policy as a genocide. We have um, an, 
question that came in from several people. Lauren wants Valerie Vecek, Karina McKenzie. They want to know what some concrete actions people can take as individuals and this cultural genocide are. Um, and in a related vein, Brett Matthews, who is a UK-based uh, textile and apparel industry journalist, um, wants to know more specifically how concerned brands should be uh, about what's happening with forced labor and their links to Xinjiang, he says. Would the panel suggest a complete boycott of all apparel and cotton with links to the Uyghur region? Um, is that appropriate given the current situation? And how does that, how would that then in turn relate to to what individuals can do as well. I know I'm that's a question. stab at the at the textiles question, unless somebody else would like to. You go ahead, Sophie. Sure. Well, I think uh, it's it is very clear that companies and third party auditors cannot do the kind of human rights due diligence that is required. Uh, either under the UN's guiding principles for business and human rights, or you know that's expected by uh, trade law. And in that sense, I think you know businesses and, and you know the other piece of the puzzle is that there has been quite good reporting about forced or compulsory labor, about labor transfer schemes that you know I think we can reasonably assume are coercive. Uh, I think if brands can't be sure that their supply chains aren't free of uh, labor rights violations, they need to think long and hard about whether they should stay in Xinjiang. Uh, and I think it's not an accident that we're starting to see both in the US and Europe and possibly a couple of other markets, you know, regulatory uh, constraints being put in place that are essentially based on rebuttable presumptions, right? The idea that, that the onus is on a company to show that they're not using forced labor than on the importer to show that, that, it's, that it's clean. Uh, and I think we're gonna see more of that in coming months because now, apologies panelists, I can't, I can't remember who made this point earlier. I think the, the very visceral response that, that often consumers have when they know that the shirt they're wearing might have been made by forced labor uh, is, is a powerful one. I think brands need to be very aware of that. Um, two, two thoughts. One, um, as, a, um, as a citizen, as an individual, um, the couple of things you could do. Um, one is related to what Sophie is saying. The global supply chain has been polluted with tainted products coming from China. So next time when you go to Costco, next time when you go to H&M, next time when you go to uh, uh, the uh, Uniqlo, be mindful. Uh, the stuff that you're buying for yourself and for your children might have been produced by forced labor. Um, and now, yesterday, uh, one of the most disturbing things that I've, uh, I've heard, the hair, the Uyghur woman's hair may be arriving to your bathroom. Be careful uh, when you're purchasing stuff that is made in China, especially in a textile in, uh, industry. And also, um, I, I also encourage the people who, who are in the management level in those uh, uh, retail business that you might be um, complicit in crime. Uh, the, you know, after the Second World War, some industrialists, uh, some representatives from the businesses stood in trial in Nuremberg. This is a serious matter. There's a law in the United States that, uh, that could go after you. Um, uh, and then thirdly, uh, as an individual, call on your representatives and support the, uh, the draft bill that addresses this very issue. Uh, there's a bill being introduced in the United States Congress to, uh, to address this for uh, modern day slavery. Um, I, oh, go please ahead. go ahead, Brian. No, please go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll try to be real brief. Um, I just add on the, um, on the forced labor issue that um, we, for Uyghurs within the borders of the People's Republic of China right now, there is no such thing as consent, particularly within Xinjiang. Whatever happens there, whatever decisions they have to make when faced with a Chinese uh, employment recruiter, for example, all happens against the background of the mass internment campaign, where people were put away for things as small as not greeting an official on the street. So there, there is no way for a person to honestly express their preferences. What this means is that all state organized labor, and 
any kind of international um, brand that's sourcing anything from Xinjiang is engaged necessarily with state recruitment of, force of, of, of laborers. All state recruitment of labor is partly forced labor because there is no way to consent. There may be even a large number of Uyghurs who, who say, I, I doubt it, but there may be a large number who say, yes, I'm happy to be moved to another city away from my family for wages that are not so great. Um, but there are also a large number who are not happy with that and they are not allowed to say yes. So there is no way now to get forced labor free products from Xinjiang. And Nuri points out that there is legislation in the US, like the TVPA, which includes criminal sentences, um, uh, imprisonment for CEOs and upper management of companies that knowingly um, acquire uh, goods that have forced labor involved in them. Thank you, Ryan. Um, unfortunately, I think I'm gonna have to cut us off <laughs> and wrap it up there. I think we could keep talking about um, these and related issues for hours and possibly days, I think. Um, but our time is up. So I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you on behalf of UHRP and the World Weir Congress to all five of our panelists. Thank you also to those of you out there in the ethers who have been submitting questions. Again, I'm so sorry that we could not get to all of them. I strongly encourage you to take to, to Twitter with some of them. If you're interested, I think they yeah, could go for it. Be great. there. And you know, these five assembled here are are wonderful at that medium. Um, I also want to thank Zumrat Ay Erkin of the World Uyghur Congress for running our tech so beautifully and smoothly today. Um, and I will wrap things up just really briefly. I know we're two minutes over already. Um, Tim Gross, who was originally going to appear on this panel today, sent in a few remarks. I definitely didn't get a chance to read or have time to read, but I, I want to end on a note that he really emphasized in them, which is that we might have forgotten in some senses the real significance of um, July 5th, the events that led to it, the Urumqi uprising, as we might call it now, um, especially as that those events were perceived by the first wave of protesters. So he has he wants to encourage us to remember, all of us, scholars, journalists, activists, anyone who's interested, and Uyghur communities as well, how important it is to rescue, reclaim, and reinterpret this history. So the Urumqi uprising, you know, is the result of a brave, courageous individuals who had, in some senses, a very simple message um, to stand up against discrimination and oppression, regardless of the consequences, as Tim so beautifully wrote. So thank you, uh, and I hope you all have a lovely you know, rest of your day and evening. And let's keep talking about this. And working thank you. That. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.